This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hi everyone. Today we're going to do a slightly different sort of video. If you haven't heard of the iceberg meme, it's one where you start with commonly known facts about a topic and go deeper and deeper into the lore as you go. Here the goal is not really to critique or analyze too much, but to kind of just state the theory. So I'll try not to let my biases get into this. No guarantees though. Our first iceberg video is on energy. This should be interesting. So let's see what we have on level 1. The future is renewable. This is pretty self-explanatory. It boils down to the expectation that a few decades into the future, all our electricity needs will be fulfilled by solar panels and wind turbines. This is a simple extrapolation of the fact that these sources of energy have been getting cheaper over the years and their use is on an exponential curve to the point that they're providing a majority of the electricity on the grid on some days of the year in certain countries. Ice cars will transition to electric cars within the next 20 years. Tesla really accelerated the transition to electric vehicles by making EVs cool, and the industry hasn't looked back since. By removing polluting ice engines from the road, we can significantly reduce CO2 emissions, noise, and particulate pollution. Several car companies are betting on EVs now, and governments are supporting them by providing subsidies and making laws to phase out ice vehicles by the mid 30s or earlier. Nuclear energy is good but can be risky. The perception of nuclear energy today is that while it's carbon free, it can render an entire area uninhabitable if the smallest thing goes wrong. This has happened before, so you can't really blame anyone who doesn't want to live near a nuclear plant. Yes, you can. We interrupt your science video for a special announcement from today's sponsor Brilliant. Brilliant is a great way to learn math, science and computer science interactively. It has thousands of lessons from algebra to astrophysics to quantum computing with exclusive new content added monthly. I'm currently going through courses on scientific thinking and it helps me learn and explain so many of the concepts that I talk about on this channel. Now more than ever we need a better understanding about what's going on around us and the challenges we face. And learning a little every day can help. I like to spend 15-20 minutes on Brilliant each day and it's been great. To get started for free visit brilliant.org/techfulladites. The first 200 of you will receive 20% off their annual premium subscription. The link will be in the description below. Now let's dip under the water for level 2. Fusion is the future of nuclear energy. This is the idea that nuclear fusion is the right way to do nuclear energy and requires only a bit more research to replace all our other sources of energy. And because the only thing you need for fuel is seawater, this would seem like the perfect source of energy. I do believe that by the end of 2052, nuclear fusion on the grid will be a reality. Carbon capture. Carbon dioxide causes global warming. So why not just capture the carbon dioxide produced by coal power plants, etc.? This has been successfully done, but the costs are something that don't add up just yet. And some people believe it will actually slow down the transition to renewables by allowing coal plant operators an excuse to keep running their plants. But if it came down to it, we could do it. But it might be a last resort kind of thing, just because of how energy intensive it is. AC versus DC. Fans of Tesla know that there was a huge battle between Tesla and Edison to decide how power would be transmitted over the grid. Edison wanted DC power, Tesla believed AC was the way to go. Edison electrocuted animals and even people on the death row to prove that AC current was dangerous. But ultimately AC proved to be the better way to go and it was universally adopted. Another detail in the story is that the battle was actually between Edison and Westinghouse. Tesla was not really involved that doesn't really diminish any of his other achievements. So I don't know why some people get hung up on this fact. Grid scale storage. This is what many people believe will enable the transition to renewables. Being able to store the electricity you generate during peak hours so that you can simply supply it when renewable generation is low. There are many technologies in discussion like flow battery, liquid metal batteries, etc. But the scale of batteries required for this is absolutely insane. We need a much bigger breakthrough for this than most people realize. And it's especially daunting when you think about long-term and seasonal storage. Hydrogen. Grid storage can back up renewables well for short periods of time. But what about entire weeks and months when renewable generation is low? Enter hydrogen. 
Excess renewable energy can be converted to hydrogen and that can be burned in gas turbines or used in fuel cells during low production months in order to produce electricity with only water as byproduct. Unfortunately, the electrolyzers that do this are not very efficient, so you lose a lot of energy in the conversion process. Still, there are many countries and companies backing hydrogen as a means of long-term energy storage. Biomass Biomass is a class of renewables that involves burning organic matter in order to run a thermal power plant. This can include pine needles, forest detritus, and wood pellets that are manufactured from forests that are replanted and maintained. Because chopping down trees for firewood doesn't on the face of it sound environmentally friendly. And according to some, it's just a massive creating accounting scam. Now on to level three. Renewables are bad. This is a viewpoint popularized by news outlets like Prager University. It basically states that the downsides of renewables, like intermittency, the cost of building and replacing them over the years, is a net negative to the economy and the environment. This is not true and has been written about extensively. And while the idea itself is wrong, there is some truth in the fact that we often forget to consider all the externalities of renewable energy. But once you do that, they still come out ahead of the status quo. Electric cars are bad. This is the same argument as before, but this time for EVs. That the energy that goes into making the battery means that they have a higher carbon footprint over the lifetime of the vehicle. This again is untrue, even when relying on only coal power plants to charge the car. The carbon footprint is almost half that of a regular car over its lifetime. Again, a good point to make you think about quantifying the things that we generally consider good. China controls solar panel production. A good reason to move away from fossil fuels is to reduce our dependencies on the countries that produce them. However, a transition to renewables will only make us dependent on someone else. 90% of solar panels today are produced in China. And while you could switch the manufacturing to other countries, that would almost certainly increase the cost of production. Lifters and thorium. Thorium reactors and specifically lifters or liquid fluoride thorium reactors are an evolution of today's reactors that can minimize the amount of nuclear waste that is produced. They also use thorium, which is far more abundant in the Earth's crust. And crucially, there's no water involved, so steam pressure explosion cannot happen. This greatly reduces the risks of using nuclear power. A lot of people like Kirk Sorensen believe that this is a reactor for the future of nuclear energy, and indeed the future of society. Humanity cannot survive without fossil fuels. This idea came to the forefront because of a book by Alex Epstein and its subsequent promotion. We use fossil fuels for everything, from plastics to fertilizers to medicines. So even if we stop using it for energy, we can't reduce the consumption of it significantly without upending human civilization. While this is mostly true, the book still comes across as, okay, too many opinions, move on. Recycling of renewables. The sun and the wind are free, but the machines we use to harvest their energies are not. Wind turbines and solar panels need material in their manufacture, and some of it is not easily recyclable. Like wind turbines can't use recycled copper, and the magnets need rare earths which are found mostly in China. Solar panels also need a particular sort of sand, which is the same kind that we use in our computer chips, and that is in short supply as well. Now pay attention, because we're headed to level four. Electricity is produced in real time. This one's a doozy, and I definitely did not know this before. But every time you switch on a light, a fan, an air conditioner, or an electric kettle, the power plant generates that much more electricity at that very moment. Electricity is produced as and when you need it. Meredith Angwin calls it the angelic miracle of the grid. And it does seem like a miracle. There's no tank of electrons stored that's smoothing over the transmission process. The power plant does this directly. Mind-blowing. Wind power is spiky. The generation curve of wind power looks something like this. It changes rapidly over time, and this is what makes it much worse than other sources of electricity. It necessitates the use of large condensers to make it suitable for transmitting over the grid. And when there are large fluctuations, 
it needs to be curtailed, switching over to fossil fuel-based pika plants. And despite having spinning blades, wind turbines do not provide any grid inertia. What's grid inertia? Grid inertia. Most power today is generated using spinning turbines. These turbines all rotate in sync depending on where you live and the frequency that's used there. If a power source drops out from the grid, the rotational inertia of these tons of metal can provide support to the grid until production can be increased to compensate. Wind and solar power do not add inertia to the grid. And so when they become a larger part of the grid, it can lead to issues with reliability. To counter this, synthetic inertia can be added to the grid by batteries. But often people don't account for that when they say wind and solar are very cheap. These are excellent technologies, but a greater degree of care is required to decide where and how they should be deployed. Nuclear power is unlimited. This is referring to the fact that if we can make fast neutron reactors, or breeder reactors that use nuclear waste as well as thorium reactors, then we have enough nuclear fuel to last us a billion years, basically forever. And if we do manage to use that up, there's pretty much an infinite amount of uranium in the sea. Energy is life as the highest principle. This is talking about how access to denser forms of energy is what has allowed human civilization to thrive. From wood to coal to petroleum to nuclear, We've come a long way. Indeed, in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, Harry Seldon predicts the downfall of the galactic empire. One of the signs of decline he determines through his equations is that knowledge of nuclear power will begin to disappear from the far-flung planets of the empire. In our world, the pattern looks simple. Where more energy is used, people enjoy a better standard of living and comfort. And going down the path of making electricity more expensive or less abundant has the potential to take us in the opposite direction. Life in the service of entropy. Jeremy England, a physicist from MIT, proposes that all life emerges in service of the second law of thermodynamics. That the entropy of a closed system increases over time. A strange thing, because life feels ordered, a defiance of entropy, even if temporary. But his argument kind of makes sense. Think about it. How much more efficient are human beings at turning energy into waste heat as compared to a rock? We serve dark, eldritch entities tied to the laws of physics themselves. Ephemeralization. Bergmeister Fuller noted in 1970 a very definite trajectory that humanity was following. Initially, you needed a massive library to store the collective knowledge of humanity. But now, just your smartphone suffices. You needed several acres of land to feed families, whereas now, you only need a few intensively farmed acres. Humanity does more and more with less and less, which suggests that there will come a day when we can do everything with nothing. Sleeping civilizations. Ephemeralization points us towards virtual worlds and virtual existences, using only a few watts of energy to do anything we want, to experience whatever we like. But there is an additional level of efficiency we can find. We can increase the amount of computation done with a given amount of energy by 10 to the power 30 times according to Landauer's limit. So we should only create our grand simulated reality when the universe is cold and dying and find some way to remain in stasis or hibernation till then. But this theory is disputed because space is pretty cold to begin with. So we can actually just go to an empty part of space and do this anytime. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something new. Do you have any more levels of weird and arcane information that you want to add? Do you want more icebergs? Or do you want us to delve deeper into one of the topics discussed today? Let us know. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring our video today. Like, share and subscribe to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.